Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this video, I'm going to talk about water and life and the importance of water for life. If I were to ask you why life requires water, you might be able to come up with maybe one reason, but you should come up with a number of reasons of why living things require water. And one of the reasons this is important now is found in the news. NASA is searching for life in the solar system, and we're getting closer and closer. And so this is Mars Curiosity. Mars Curiosity is a rover about the size of a Mini Cooper. And what it's doing, you can see here, is scooping soil, and then it's doing chemical analysis of the soil on Mars. And what did it find? It found large amounts of water. Now that water is going to be in the form of ice, but there's water everywhere on Mars. And if there's water there, and there was liquid water at some point, there was probably life, or there could have been life there. Now they haven't found any evidence of life, but they are finding organic material, and they're not sure if it was there or if they maybe brought it with them. Also in the news last week, they found water on Mercury. And so wherever we look in the solar system, we're finding water. How did the water get here? Water was probably delivered like it was on our planet. It was delivered in meteorites and asteroids and it still remains there today. And so this quote from Jim Green, Jim Green, director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, is great. The more we examine the solar system, the more we realize it's a very soggy place. And what's cool about that is if we can find water out there, there's the idea that we could also find life. And so what is it about water that makes it a great um, place for life to exist? Well, the whole thing is based on this idea that water is polar. What does that mean? Well, in a water molecule, so we've got a water molecule right here, we've got one oxygen and two hydrogens. This is going to be a covalent bond. So there's a covalent bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. So this line right here are two covalent bonds. But what's interesting about that is oxygen is greedy. It's highly electronegative, and so it's going to pull the electrons closer to it and so there's going to be a partial negative charge. That's what this symbol means right here. So there's a negative charge on these two parts of the water. And then there's going to be a positive part or a positive charge where the hydrogen is. And so this is one water molecule and it's polar. And so if I were to represent this as a water molecule, there's going to be a negative charge right here and then there's going to be a positive charge up here. Positive where the hydrogen is and then negative where the oxygen is. And so what you get is a bond. So you get a bond between this hydrogen and this oxygen. And we call that a hydrogen bond. And so there's a connection between the two. In other words, if I pull this one in this direction, this one's going to want to come with it. And so they're attracted. And so the importance of water being polar leads to the importance of it being a, 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 a area where life can exist. And the first good reason why life requires water is that it's a very good solvent. And what that means is it can dissolve material. Um, I learned this when I was washing dishes. It takes a long time to scrub dishes, especially ones that are really gross. And so the best way to clean out a dish is just to fill it with water and let it sit. And the water is going to start to dissolve that material and make it easier for you to clean it. Another reason why is that ice floats. What does that mean? Well, ice and water, for that matter, unlike almost anything else in the universe, is going to become less dense when it gets colder. And the reason why is these hydrogen bonds will form a lattice when it gets colder and actually push it apart. And what happens, therefore, is that ice floats. And that's weird. Almost everything else doesn't do that. And what would happen if ice didn't float? Well, the ice would sink to the bottom of lakes and oceans. It would freeze down there, and pretty soon all of that water would be in the form of ice. It also has high heat capacity. In other words, this bond between the two, this hydrogen bond between all of these water molecules, basically makes it really hard to heat it up and when you do that, it requires a lot of energy. And it also takes a lot of energy. It's going to release a lot of energy as it cools down. And so it's one of the big reasons why we're filled with water, in that it allows us to thermoregulate. And then, more importantly, it's going to be a conduit, or it's going to be where metabolism takes place. And so all the chemical reactions inside you are taking place in water. And some of them actually consume or release water. And so it's very important in metabolism. And so if I were to take this list, these are four reasons why life requires water. It's good at dissolving material, ice floats, 
gives us high heat capacity, and then um, it also is going to be where metabolism takes place. But when I talk to students, I find the two that are most confusing are what are this idea of water and how it acts as a solvent, and then how is it important in metabolism? And so it's hard for us to kind of understand how water works because we can't really see it. And so I've got a simulation that I think will help. And so this is from PHET. These are a number of simulations coming out of the University of Colorado, and they allow you to see molecules. And, and, and this one is called Sugar and Salt Solutions. And so I'd, I would encourage you to go here and watch it um, or play around with it. And so I'm going to launch that. And so basically what you can do is you can play around with everything in the simulation. And so in this case, I've got salt here in a salt shaker, and then I've got water down here, and I've got a couple of faucets. And so what I can do is I can grab the salt, and I can shake the salt. And when I shake the salt, you can see that the salt is flowing down here into this now salt solution. And you can also measure the concentration. And so over here, you can see that the concentration is increasing inside there. And so I'm going to add a bunch of salt so I can get really salty water. Oops, I'm out of salt. Okay, so here's my concentration, so the salt that I have. So think about this for a second. What would happen if I were to add water to this salt solution? So we can do that. So what happened to the concentration? Oh, you can see that it's going down because there's less water. What would happen here if I were to just dump out some of that salt solution? So the concentration should stay the same because it's already mixed in. And then another question might be, well, what's going to happen if I evaporate the water? So when I evaporate the water, you can see the concentration is going up. And so if you have an understanding of solutions, that might make sense to you. But if you can't see it, it's hard to understand it. And so let's go to the micro level. Okay, so now let's take this salt or sodium chloride. And let's throw that in the water now. But what you see is that we actually see the atoms in that um, salt. And so what it's doing is it's breaking down into the sodium and the chloride ions. And so this is a ionic compound, sodium chloride by itself. That means that there's been a transfer of the electrons. And now we have two ions, and they're held together by an ionic bond. And so what happens when you add sodium chloride again? So let's reset that again. So if I add sodium chloride or salt, you can see that once it gets in the water, it's going to quickly dissolve that salt. And so a really cool thing we could do is we could evaporate the water. And let's watch what's going on here. So when I evaporate the water, watch what happens at the end. So now I'm going to get rid of all of that water. And all of a sudden, it forms a salt crystal again. And so again, you might understand how that works, but it's probably not. Until we get to this level of the water molecules, a lot of this doesn't make sense. And so now we have water molecules right here. And so we know that those water molecules are polar. It means that we have a negative charge down here, and then we have a positive charge up here. And if you were to look at this simulation, what you'll find is patterns start to emerge. And what that means is the red areas, the negative charges, are usually going to be touching the positive of water molecules that are adjacent to it. In other words, the positive and the negative are attracted to each other, and that's through that hydrogen bond. And so what's going to happen if we throw a chunk of salt in it? And we'll watch this carefully. OK, so let's watch this sodium right here. That sodium has a positive charge. And so you can see that all the water around the outside are lining up so their negative end is touching that sodium or the oxygen side. Likewise, if we look up here at the chlorine, which sides are grabbing onto the chlorine? Oops, that one left. Let's go look down here. There's a negative chlorine. You can see that all the positive parts of the water are being attracted to that. And so why is water a good solvent? It's a good solvent because it's polar. That means it has positive parts and it has negative parts. And so if we add a salt in this case to it, it can grab onto that with all the negatives grabbing onto the positives and then vice versa down here. And so what happens in this simulation back here, so if we reset this and we add sodium chloride to it, we're literally breaking that salt down into its different ions. And that's because water is a really good solvent. So you can think about this. Now, once we've broken it down, all these mat materials can move around. And so all of the chemicals inside you are diffusing and bouncing around, and they're doing that through the water. And it's really important that the water is a good solvent. OK, let's look at sugar, though, because we require sugar as well. Let's look at what happens to sucrose. Well, if we throw that in, sucrose, remember, a disaccharide. Well, this is different than what happened to the salt. And so they didn't break down into their individual atoms. And that's because it's held together with covalent bonds. But they're still moving around. And so now we've created a solution where all these molecules can move around. And so you can pick up the material that you need. Now let's look at that at a water level. So let me reset this for a second. 
What happens if we throw sucrose into water? So these are a little bigger. So it's going to readily dissolve. And the reason why, and the reason sucrose doesn't break down, is there are covalent bonds that are holding it together. But watch the water around the outside. It's dancing back and forth. Sometimes it's the positive, sometimes it's the negative. And that's because this has a lot of hydroxyl groups. It has a lot of oxygen and hydrogen on it as well. And so it can grab onto that. And so water is really good at dissolving material. And so all the material inside your body, all of this chemical reactions is moving around, bouncing around, and it's doing that because of water. And so we think if we were to find life out there somewhere, um, it's probably going to be as a result of water. Water acting as a solvent, remember, and being an area where you can have metabolism. And for me, I just keep reading the news because I'm excited to see what NASA finds. Because if they could find life somewhere else in the solar system, I think it could be one of the greatest scientific discoveries ever. And so that's water, that's life, and I hope that was helpful.